This Sunday, new president, growing challenges. Help you, God. Help you, God. Joe Biden takes the oath of office with a message of unity. Politics doesn't have to be a raging fire, destroying everything in his path. President Trump leaves Washington without attending the inauguration. Goodbye. We love you. We will be back in some form. And Mr. Biden immediately gets to work undoing the Trump presidency with executive orders covering issues from immigration to the economy. There's no time to start right today. My guest this morning, President Biden's chief of staff, Ron Klain. Plus, full-scale wartime effort against COVID. Let me be the clearest on this point. Help is on the way. We need more vaccine. We need more vaccine. Mr. Biden reverses the Trump approach, launching a centralized response to fight the pandemic. If we get 70 to 85 percent of the country vaccinated, let's say by the end of the summer, by the time we get to the fall, we will be approaching a degree of normality. Also, impeachment part two. The Senate trial begins in two weeks. What could impeachment mean for the new president's call for unity? It's unconstitutional. It says a bad president for the presidency and continues to divide the nation. I don't think it's very unifying to say, oh, let's just forget it and move on. I'll talk to Democratic Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois and Republican Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota. Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC News Chief Washington Correspondent Andrea Mitchell, New York Times columnist David Brooks, Yamiche Alcindor, White House Correspondent for PBS NewsHour, and Tim Alberta, Chief Political Correspondent for Politico. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. It's Sunday morning from our brand new studio where we are broadcasting from. After more than 60 years are at our historic location in Upper Northwest Washington. A new studio for a new administration. Much as President Trump sought to undo the legacy of his predecessor, Barack Obama, so Joe Biden is moving to escape the shadow of Donald Trump and unwind that presidency. Four years after President Trump's American carnage speech, Joe Biden stressed a theme of unity in his inaugural address. Then moving on from rhetoric, Mr. Biden went to work immediately to erase much of what he could with a pen of Donald Trump's presidency, issuing 17 executive orders on day one on everything from economic relief to climate change to racial justice to immigration to the pandemic and, of course, oh, by the way, an order that stopped construction on the wall. In addition to all of that, the House will transmit its article of impeachment to the Senate tomorrow with a trial in two weeks. But it is one issue, the pandemic that presents the new Biden administration with both its greatest challenge and its greatest opportunity. The president's ambitious multi-tiered national strategy to combat the virus is precisely the kind of muscular response the Trump administration avoided. So will it work? 418,000 Americans are dead from COVID-19 and another 100,000 are likely to die in the next 30 days. It's not hyperbole to say that the Biden presidency hinges on its success against the pandemic. His administration's success in taking on all aspects of this health catastrophe will also go a long way towards not just determining America's trust in this new president, but in proving that government still has the ability to get big things done. We're in a national emergency. We need to act like we're in a national emergency. Pre you do think that you... Your news every hour in prime time is a overnight. We can do better. We can not only control COVID, but get us back to real normality. But it takes everybody, all hands on deck. We've got to make sure we're coordinating and we are talking to people. We're, we can't just tell the states, here's some PPE, some masks, here's some vaccine, now go do it. No, no. When we hand them over, we stay with them and, and provide resources to make it happen. We do that. Dana, if we get people following the president, president's guidance of wearing a mask for these first 100 days, we're going to get control of this thing. Let's talk about the vaccine. Uh, president Biden set a goal of 100 million vaccine doses in 100 days. But the U.S. had almost reached that pace before he took office. And nobody thinks that the vaccine distribution is going well right now, that it's not good enough. So is 100 million doses in the first 100 days ambitious enough? It's ambitious. It's certainly going to, we're going to need to do even more. 
But before we can even do the ambitious part, we got to get everything working together because we just spent the first question and answer talking about how what we, what we inherited didn't work. And now we got to make it work. But I, I believe President Biden is going to be ambitious in everything he tries to do in these four years he's got as a, as a president to get us back on track. And you have to be. You've got to get the American people kick-started. And I, I think that's what he's trying to do. But he's trying to do it the right way. He's going to give people the plan. He's going to give people facts. He's going to rely on a cooperation. It's a partnership. Yeah, and I hear you, but presidents like that set, set goals at, and use their leadership to set goals for all of the players to try to meet. And I'm sure you've seen that some critics have said that the Biden administration is trying to set expectations lower in order to get a political achievement. What do you say to that? Well, if, if the plane is diving like this, you're certainly not going to see it appear like this overnight. What you're trying to do is get the plane from being like this to getting straightened out and then going like this. In, in three and in 100 days, getting 100 uh, shots out there on vaccines, 100 million shots out there in vaccines is incredibly important. It's ambitious, it's bold, it's doable. We, we have to do it, but we have to recognize that we're doing it while the plane is in a dive like this. I want to show our viewers some pictures of really long lines. Senior citizens waiting for hours to get vaccines in your home state of California. It's chaotic across the country. People don't know where to sign up. Appointments are getting canceled. Some people uh, are just walking into pharmacies and getting the vaccine. What is the Biden administration going to do to fix that mess? Yeah, Dan, it, it, that's not America. That's, that's not the way we treat those we consider vulnerable in need of this vaccine most. That is not America at its best. Nor was it good to see so many people in line for hours just trying to vote. That's not America either. What we have to do is show people how it can be done. You can't just tell the states and the local governments, here's some vaccines, now you go do it. No, we have to coordinate. We have to provide the resources. Many of these states, as you know, are suffering through massive budget deficits. They're trying to figure out where they get the resources to help these overburdened and tired health workers. President uh, uh, Biden's plan provides for 100,000 new health care workers to get out there to all the states to help. It's a, it's a plan so, that can work if we all get, you know, put our muscle to it together. So when will anyone who wants a vaccine be able to get one? Well, that's a, that's a matter of making sure we're coordinating, coordinating with the states because it's not the federal government that's putting the vaccine in the arm, but we are trying to provide it. We're providing the resources and the help to make it happen. And what we want to make sure is that the locals, when they're doing this, have a plan that's clear, that's, uh, that uh, everyone understands, so there's no lines, and so that everyone knows that we're in this together. Right. The Cashmans became climate refugees, people driven from their homes by the fires, floods, and hurricanes of our worsening climate. Some people are being impacted by displacement from storms and forest fires and extreme events. Jesse Keenan teaches at the Tulane School of Architecture. He studies the effect of climate change on people and cities. We think that people are going to be changing their decisions increasingly about where to live, how to live. Are there any examples of that? Any cities that you've studied where that's going on? Really, there isn't a community uh, in America, particularly in coastal America, where we are not seeing some transition uh, away from the coast uh, and moving to higher ground. Places like Miami, New Orleans, San Francisco, uh, even in D.C., we see uh, environmental risk from flood shaping property values and shaping where people want to live. Of course, not everybody has the option of moving. It's not easy for folks to just pick up and leave a place. Jalan White Newsom is a consultant, researcher, and advocate who focuses on climate and racial justice. She says that extreme weather hits communities of color disproportionately hard, yet their residents may be the least able to move. It's not that folks want to stay in harm's way, but the fact that they might not have the resources to move, that they have invested all that they have into their home, whether they're renting or owning it. And then there's also this sense of community. It's that sense of connection, not only with their neighbors, but their faith community, their jobs, their kids are in school. Still, 40 million Americans do move every year. They retire, they graduate, 
they get jobs or lose jobs, they fall in love or break up. If you have the luxury of choosing where to live and climate change is a factor, here's the formula. You want to be far enough inland to avoid the rising seas and flooding, far enough north to avoid the worst of the heat waves, far enough west and north to avoid the hurricanes, and far enough east to avoid the wildfires. Droughts are becoming more desperate every decade in our western states, so you also want plenty of fresh water. So where does that leave you? The Great Lakes, the abundance of natural resources and fresh water in particular. Cities like Buffalo, like Cleveland, like Toledo, Ohio are really prime. There's a cultural capacity, there's a legacy, there's a history, there's infrastructure there, there's art. That's a good point. There's more to a city than its weather. You also want good schools, fine hospitals, sports and culture, a reasonable cost of living, and a high quality of life. At least one American city fits all of these criteria. No hurricanes. Okay, wildfires? No wildfires. Uh, how about sea level rise? Well, the lakes look pretty steady to me. <laughs> Welcome to Madison, Wisconsin. There's a coffee shop, there's a pizza place, there's a bookstore. Satya Rhodes Conway is Madison's mayor and a climate resilience advocate. We have solar on almost every municipally owned building. At this point, we have a goal of being 100% renewable for city operations by 2030. So people think of Madison as cold. What we like to say here is that there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you're properly dressed, you can enjoy being outdoors year-round here in Madison. Is it your impression that with the change in climate, the winters are becoming milder here? Yes, it's, you know, today it's above freezing. We're in January. That's not normal. Right, right. <laughs> Definitely the average, I think, is getting a lot warmer. In fact, five degrees warmer since 1950. So tell me about what Madison is like in, for example, the summer and the fall. Well, in the summer, there's so many opportunities to get outside and to enjoy the lakes, to enjoy our neighborhoods. In the fall, you live in this part of the world and you get beautiful color. We have 270 parks in Madison. Now, no place is perfect, even Madison. When we make another sort of number one or top ten, well, that's clearly true for the white population. Mm. Is that also true for people of color? Right. And the answer is almost always no, it's not also true. And so that's part of our work going forward. Madison isn't the only great climate haven city. It looks like it's nighttime. The Cashman family moved about as far from California's wildfires as they could get, near Burlington, Vermont, and they couldn't be happier. It's beautiful, it's green, it's not dry. Uh, there's no fires that I know of. It's just a very functional, athletic, happy, healthy place. The community embraced us immensely um, with our children. And I knew, I said, we, we made the right decision. We made it. Build it. Maid tag. KitchenAid. Tell me how much weight you lost with Nutrisystem. The old way of doing business look... Professor Tim Snyder is a professor of history at uh, Yale University. He's the author of best-selling uh, books, including On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. Uh, those lessons are remarkably relevant right now. Professor Snyder, thank you again for joining us. All right, remember when the former president said there were fine people on both sides of the deadly neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville? Well, there were not. Some things just don't have two sides, like white nationalist riots or the incitement of an insurrection at the United States Capitol. I'll talk about that next. You're watching Velshi on MSNBC. Logged into these customers' accounts in order to view their footage in their own homes. Legal analyst Joey Jackson is with me now to discuss. For a security company, Joey, I mean, it was that simple. He was in their homes, and you trust a security company. He said, let me add myself to your email, and there he goes for years. Yeah, Susan, good morning to you. This is beyond the pale, right? And then, of course, you add the irony of this, a security company, and they're there in order to protect you, to safeguard you, to make sure you are feeling safe, right? And your family's safe and everyone's secure. Oh, not so much. 
What they're doing, of course, or this individual was doing, we'll see what further investigations reveal as to any others, but you see him there, 35-year-old, former tech, having fled to computer fraud. The fact is, is that if somebody does this to you and is spying on what you're doing, not once, not twice, 220 customers, almost 10,000 times, it's really beyond the pale, and the company really needs to do a deep dive into their own measures and systems and reassure the public as we're looking at those case details that you're safe with ADT. And a statement from ADT, Joey, says this, um, that we are grateful to the Dallas FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office for holding Telesforo Alves responsible for a federal crime, saying we are using all of our resources to ensure their safety and provide peace of mind. The other point is how misleading this is to Catholics. Uh, she and other Catholic politicians, and now even our president, are giving the impression that it's acceptable to be a Catholic and, and favor abortion. But that's not. Catholics don't favor what's evil. And it's hard to imagine anything more evil than dismembering babies in their mother's womb. We have to admit the raw evil that abortion is. One thing that might come close is, is um, abandoning women who are suffering the trauma of the experience because they didn't really have any choice. We pastors of souls hear this a lot from women who have gone through this experience. The reality is women of means have choice, but others don't and it this kind of removes the veil of this rhetoric of choice the problem is not that women have choice too many women don't have choice and that's their only alternative so uh, Archbishop you know you're talking about the dignity of human life in the womb uh, which which is yes. a, a, an issue of great passion uh, and principle for the Catholic Church why is it that so many prominent Democrat politicians Catholics are comfortable holding that disconnect what is it about this issue that they're happy to disregard their faith when it pertains to abortion uh, it's become a very politicized issue. I think uh, there's a long, long history in this country of, of Catholics in the Democratic Party. Uh, when Catholics were uh, poor immigrant people and Democrats were championing the cause of the working class family, the farmer, the factory worker, and so forth, and they were giving Catholics the, the support they needed to, not only material support, to, but to assimilate into the country. So there's this long association, especially with the labor movement. But then all uh, the political landscape all changed in sure. the 60s and the 70s, and the Democratic Party went in this direction. And uh, Catholics, so many Catholics had been so connected to the Democratic Party because how they were assisted by them. They just moved in that direction and made this false dichotomy between the policies they support and what they personally believe. That's a great explanation. Uh, Mr. Archbishop, thank you so much for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for great having me. And for having the courage to stand up and take that stand. From the silver screen to saving lives, one North Carolina movie theater teaming up with healthcare heroes to bring the COVID vaccine to their community. The unlikely partners join us next. Um, what that war stole from him or took from him. I had friends that I visit. Things, that's what I collect with the trial and it's just going to be bad for the country it really is so uh, let me ask you the same question i just asked senator romney would you support ending this trial if you can on procedural grounds uh it, that it's unconstitutional to try a, a president who's left office without ever getting to the issue of the guilt or innocence of donald trump yeah, the first chance I get to vote to end this trial, I'll do it, because I think it's really bad for America. If you want to hold people accountable, there's other ways to do it, particularly for president, including, as I said, the perspective of history, and, and even now, as people are learning more about all this. But it's really bad. When you talk about situations like this, this is, this is not a criminal justice trial. This is a political process. And ultimately, it is a political process that's going to inject things into our public discourse, into our debates, that's going to make it harder to get important things done, and it's just going to continue to fuel uh, these divisions that have paralyzed the country and, and have turned us into a country of people that hate each other. I, I want to ask you one last question on this, then we'll move on. What about the argument that it would be useful from the point of view of, of, of people who think that what the president did was wrong to ban him from seeking public office again, which would be one of the results of holding this trial? I think that's an arrogant statement for anyone to make. Voters get to decide that. We, who are we to tell voters who they can vote for in the future? Okay.
okay? <laughs> I, I talked with uh, Senator Romney about Joe Biden's call for, for unity, and you have spoken sharply already about Biden's first days in office. I'm going to put up a tweet that you, uh, you sent out on Friday. So far, Biden has talked, talked like a centrist, but governed from the radical left. So, Senator Rubio, is talk of unity from this White House dead already? Yeah, no, unity and ideology are two separate things, okay? Unity is, I mean, uniformity. That's ridiculous. We are a country that the elections prove it. The 50-50 split in the Senate proves we've got people with very different opinions. And we settle that argument through a process in our republic in which we elect people to have debates and try to find a way to move forward. That's separate from portraying yourself as a centrist, but the first thing you do is get thousands of people fired at the stroke of a pen by ending the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, jump on the issue of, uh, of you know, gender when it comes to sports and who can use what bathrooms and so forth and so on. Uh, an immigration uh, uh, order that I think could be read. I've asked for clarification. I hope it doesn't mean this, but I think it could be read to say that someone who's committed a very serious crime has raped or, or sexually abused a minor. As long as they were released from prison before the 19th of January, they're not a priority for deportation. Um, those are not centrist ideas. Now, I understand Joe Biden comes from the left of center. I understand all that. But this is some of these are far left of center ideas. So my point in that tweet was he may use the language, the rhetoric, even the demeanor of a centrist. But so far, his policies don't seem to represent that. And, uh, and I think that's an important thing to note as we get into these debates about different issues. I'm going to pick up on this issue of immigration. Uh, President Biden signed a number of executive actions on immigration in these first few days. He has introduced legislation that would give 11 million people a path to citizenship over the next eight years. You, of course, back in 2013, were a leader on the issue of immigration reform. You had a, a plan that would lead to a path to citizenship, as I remember, in 13 years. But you're talking about the Biden plan so far on immigration as, as coming right up close to amnesty. Is that fair? Yeah, because that's very different from what we talked about back then. That, that, back then, we also talked about $25, $30 billion for border security, including fencing and so forth. It, it, talk, it had those sorts of provisions in there. It talked about reforming the immigration system so that it was more merit-based, meaning you, you bring people in on the basis of what they can do for a living and not just primarily whether they have family members living here. That's not what he's talking about. He's basically talking simply and almost entirely about what to do with people that are here in an unlawful status, of which I think the majority of Americans believe we need to do something. But you can only do something after you've got in place immigration reforms that allow you to secure the border and stop illegal immigration. Otherwise, doing something is going to encourage more people to come. We saw a very brief example of that. Just the fact that he was elected incentivized some of these trafficking networks to try to push people to the United States through one of these caravans. That's a reality. And, and um, so... Again, I, I, not, not to mention that back when we did it in 2013, we weren't in the midst of a pandemic, which I think should be the number one focus outside of national security, and I actually think is related to national security. Is, I'm going to switch subjects on you now, is the GOP still the party of Trump for the foreseeable future, and do you see it at some point over the next three, four years moving away from President Trump? The GOP is the party that nominated Donald Trump, and the reason why it did and ultimately got him elected and he got 75 million votes is because you have tens of millions of Americans that feel this economy isn't working for people like them, that feel socially displaced, even like strangers in their own country, and who believe that both of the parties, at least traditionally, and all of politics doesn't understand or care about any of this, that they don't matter to people. Donald Trump did not create those things. He, he got elected because of those things. He got 75 million votes because of those things. And those factors, those feelings that are out there among tens of millions of Americans, didn't leave when he left on Wednesday. They're still there. That's why he got elected, and that's what I hope we'll be a party of. Now, I hope we can do it in a way that keeps the people who believe we're fighting for them and brings back some of the people that perhaps didn't vote for Republicans or didn't vote for the president because they may not like you know, the way it was said or the way it was done. I think that's quite possible, and I think that's the future of the Republican Party because, frankly, on that, I think depends the future of the country. Finally, you're up. Yeah. We'll spend our... ...point in giving businesses a helping hand. 
We want to get the economy back on its feet. We want to get kids back in school. Let's do that as a priority on a bipartisan basis. I want to end with a question that I will be asking um, Senator Rounds as well. When you heard President Biden's call for unity, what did that mean to you? What does that define the unit, his call for unity? It means um, a lot. It means a new president who truly is going to reach out in a respectful way to the Republicans and to the Democrats to get something done. I know Joe Biden and I served with him and Kamala Harris. They know how to pass legislation by working in a respectful way, constructive way, with Republicans who want to help us get America moving again. I heard that loud and clear, and that's what I think Joe Biden won the election on November 3rd. All right, Senator Dick Durbin, Democrat from Illinois, the number two in leadership, and also now chair of the Judiciary Committee, or will be when you guys come to an organizing agreement, we can officially call you that. Senator Durbin, thank you for coming on and sharing your perspective with us. Thanks, Chuck. Let me turn now to you, Senator Rounds, and as I promised, uh, that last question to him is going to be my first question to you. When President Biden called for unity in his inaugural speech, how do you, how do you define that call for unity in your, in your head? Well, it begins, first of all, by recognizing that there are different points of view about how we move forward with regard to the pandemic. And I think we all want to have the same goal of eliminating this pandemic as quickly as we can, but what's the right philosophy? Second of all, it's with regard to how we move things through the Senate. Are we prepared to actually take and to look at uh, both sides and what's the best of both? Can we sit down and actually work together on issues? Infrastructure is one area where we may very well be able to work together on things, but let's test it and let's find out whether or not we can actually come to a consensus that will last long term, mm -hmm. not just for one or two years. I want to ask you specifically about the COVID relief bill, the $1.9 trillion here. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if you believe that, look, the election has consequences. Seven, you know, if Joe Biden won by 7 million votes. Is that a mandate? Should that not be considered a mandate to go in his direction on COVID, at least, for a period of time? Does he not get some benefit of the doubt in, in your mind or no? You know, I, I really don't think we're that far off with regard to the direction for COVID relief, specifically in targeted areas. I think we all want to make sure that we've properly funded the, the, the availability of vaccines, a, a good plan for getting it out in all states. And in South Dakota, one of the biggest challenges we've got is knowing in advance how many we're going to get per week. But as soon as we get it here, we're getting it out. Um, those are the types of things I, I think we're going to find ourselves in agreement with a number of different areas there. The real challenge is, is whether or not Democrats are prepared to perhaps release some of the items that are not specifically targeted to COVID relief. You know, and the one, Chuck, you brought it up earlier, uh, minimum wage development. Uh, when I was a governor, I actually looked at it here in South Dakota. When I was in the South Dakota legislature, I actually voted for it. But that doesn't mean that I did it without putting together consensus on it. And if you're going to talk about an emergency operation, why would you then include and demand that that be a part of it? I think that's just looking for a way not to get some things done that might very well have to be done in the next couple of weeks. Well, and let me ask you this. Would you support some raise in the minimum wage? I mean, you know, when we consider it does seem as if some of these things are negotiable. Uh, we haven't raised the minimum wage in, in, in years. It's sitting at 725. Would you raise it to, if it was 12? instead of 15, would that make it easier for you to support this bill? I think the, the bigger issue here is, is whether or not we're going to be specific on COVID relief. If you want to do those other items such as that, then let's break it out, let's separate it out, take the time, and, and do it correct. But let's go back in and focus once again on COVID relief. And, and I'll say this again. Look, Republicans and Democrats alike want to get ahead of this as quickly as we can. Warp speed worked. It was done un literally unanimously. The Senate worked together to get that done. We've done something here in a matter of 10 to 12 months that has never been done before with the creation of new vaccines and getting literally millions and millions of these out. It was a consensus-driven approach that everybody in the United States Senate literally supported or it couldn't have been done that quickly. That's doable again. But we didn't try to include other things that many of us would have liked to have had included because we knew that we had to find consensus. Let's but, focus on those things that we can get done that we agree are specifically targeted to COVID relief. Let me move to the impeachment. Do you believe Donald Trump committed an impeachable offense? 
To begin with, I think it's a moot point because I think right now Donald Trump is no longer the president. He is a former president. Constitution, and I think, and I know that there are other people out there that may disagree with me, but Article 1, uh, sections, I think it's three or uh, 6 and 7, specifically point out that you can impeach the president, and it does not indicate that you can impre impeach someone who is not in office. So I, I think it's a, a moot point, and I think it's one that... Uh, that, were, that they would have a very difficult time in, in, in trying to get done within the Senate. But um, for right now, I think there are other things that we'd rather be working on instead. I know that the Biden administration would love to have more of their cabinet in place. There's a number of Republicans who also feel the same way. We should allow this president the opportunity to form his cabinet and to get that in place as quickly as possible. If we start working on, on, on an impeachment, which wow. looks like we're going to end up doing, We've only got a couple of weeks here in which to actually work through and allow this president an opportunity to form a cabinet. A lot of us would prefer to maybe work through those issues instead. Senator, I want to uh, note something you did on a press release the day before the insurrection. You wrote, I wholeheartedly support an independent investigation into the 2020 election. I'm interested in restoring faith, certainty, and transparency for the American voter. And unless we get to the bottom of these allegations, I fear Americans' faith in our electoral process is in great jeopardy. Obviously, the next night, you know, colleagues of yours, including Mitt Romney, said, you know, part of the problem here with sort of appeasing this belief that something went wrong with the election is that these people were lied to. Do you at all regret this statement that basically you helped um, further this lie, even, even, it, even, it, even indirectly by implying there should be some investigation for allegations that just didn't, don't exist? still believe that we should have an investigation but, and I think it should be bipartisan in nature. 74 million, 74 million Americans supported President Trump. There's probably 50 million Americans out there that have questions about whether or not the election was fair. Whose fault is that? Well, Isn't look, that, he, 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 I mean, the, that, they were fed a lie. The best way to approach this, well, I see, and I think, I think Democrats should have an interest in doing this as well because in, in a bipartisan approach, they can actually point out what they believe to be the purpose. And very honestly, I, I will tell you that I think if you move this through, for, if you move this forward, and you allow for an investigation to actually look, you're going to find that the election was fair. That's my belief. But at the same time, let's show it to the American people. Let's point out that if there's misinformation out there, which well, I believe there was, okay. then let's put that out and, and, and lay it out so that people yeah. can see it. I think that said, we've got a piece of legislation in Senate Bill 13 which would do exactly that. Republicans and Democrats alike should support that. We want those 50 million Americans plus to feel that they have full faith in uh, the election process, and we think that those states did a good job, but the best way to do it is right. to work our way through it and allow them and actually show them publicly how well it was actually run. Senator Rounds, Republican of South Dakota, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. When we come back, impeachment part two. With 51 votes, if they can't get Republican support, say, before the impeachment trial? Well, I don't know what the word compromise means. I know that working families are in, living today in more economic desperation than since the Great Depression. And if Republicans are willing to work with us to address that crisis, welcome. Let's do it. But what we cannot do is wait weeks and weeks and months and months to go forward. We have got to act now. That is what the American uh, people want. Now, as you know, reconciliation, which is a Senate rule, was used by the Republicans under Trump to pass massive tax breaks to the rich and large corporations. It was used as an attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and what we are saying is, you use it for that, that's fine. We're going to use reconciliation, that is 50 votes in the Senate plus the Vice President, to pass legislation desperately needed by working families in this country right now. You did it, we're going to do it, but we're going to do it to protect ordinary people, not just the rich and the powerful. And what's your timeline on that? As soon as we possibly can. Look, Donna, you know, I know these are crazy times. We've got a new president in, we're dealing with the horrors of this pandemic, which also have got to be addressed immediately. We have not done a good job in producing the amount of vaccine that we need and certainly getting it into the arms of people. Do you want it done before the, the impeachment trial right. starts? We got to do everything. I mean, this is not, you don't have the time to sit around, you know, weeks on impeachment and not get vaccines into the arms of people. 
You don't have time to worry about vaccines and not deal with the fact that children in America are going hungry. We gotta break through this old approach that the Senate takes years and years to do anything. We got a crisis right now. We can chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. The American people are hurting and they want us to act. That's what our candidates ran for in this election. That's what the guys in Georgia won on. And we have got to reaffirm the faith of the American people in government that we can respond to their pain. You mentioned that Republicans have used the so-called reconciliation process before, like in 2017, to try to kill Obamacare. Um, you accused them of abusing the process back then. You said, quote, the function of reconciliation is to adjust federal spending and revenue, not to enact major changes in policy. But uh, you alluded to this. You are the chairman of the budget committee, or going to be. You are already talking about using this tactic for things like paid family and medical leave, for universal pre-K and child care, for climate change, tuition-free college, uh, eliminating student debt, and the $15 minimum wage. How is that not what you criticize Republicans for doing? Well, the devil is in the details of what we want to do and when we want to do it and when we have to do it. What we are talking about, by the way, are two separate reconciliation packages. Number one, the emergency one right now. Right. Get direct checks. Get those checks into people's pockets right now so they can feed their families. And make sure that people are not evicted from their homes. Make sure that states have the funds they need to get vaccines into people's homes. That's what we've got to do right now. And then as soon as that is done, we have to rebuild this economy. Unemployment is much, much too high. Wages are much, much too low. There are structural problems that we have had, we have ignored for years. Climate change is a reality. And you're okay doing all of that through this process that you criticize Republicans for using? This, these are major policy well, changes. These are major policy changes, but the devil is in the details. And I criticize Republicans, yeah, for using reconciliation to give tax breaks to billionaires, to create a situation where large profitable corporations now pay zero in federal income taxes. Yes, I did criticize them for that. And if they want to criticize me, by helping to feed children who are hungry, or senior citizens of this country who are isolated and alone and don't have enough food, they can criticize me. I think it's the appropriate step forward. If Democrats don't pass these sweeping changes you're talking about, do you think that they will lose control of the House and Senate in 2022? Uh, that's what history tells us. What history tells us is that when Clinton uh, won in 92, two years later, the Democrats didn't do as much as they should have. They got swept out by the Republicans. Obama won in 2008, 2010. Republicans uh, decimated them at, at the polling booths. Look, Donna, this is not complicated stuff. We're in an unprecedented moment in American history. Tens of millions of people are hurting. People are watching this program do not have food in their cupboards to feed their kids. They are sick. They cannot afford to go to the doctor. They cannot afford the outrageously high cost of prescription drugs. They're worried about climate change and what that would mean for their kids and future generations. That is where we are right now. And the American people say, we elected you guys. Do something. Improve our lives. We are in pain. We are hurting. That's in red states, Republican states. It is in Democratic states. It is in rural America. It is in urban America. It is black, white, Latino, Native American, Asian American. This is a country that is in pain right now. And if Democrats, who have slim majorities, in the House and the Senate, we've got President Biden in the White House. If we do not respond now, yes, I believe two years from now, the Republicans will say, hey, you elected these guys. Mm, they did nothing. Vote for us. And they vote win. One of the things that has uh, seemed around a factory, a warehouse, and see forklifts driving past big pieces of art. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. They thrive on creativity. It's central to imagining new fabrics and designs. Only because we have the art around us, help us to be creative. And creative is the first vaccine against the COVID. The first vaccine. Good Great. stuff, Brian. And so are you, Brian, despite the fame. Yeah. Great job. Great job <laughs> okay. at seven all week, by the way. Thanks, Fantastic. Brian. And thanks for joining uh, us. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the support. Bye, Jed. Right. Take care. All right, we told you earlier about this. Disney World is now selling grilled cheese on donuts. Everglaze Donuts and Cold Brew Shop at Disney Springs offering the sweet and cheesy item. The shop's grilled cheese is already served on a sweet griddle bun, but you can now substitute it for a glazed donut for $1 more. So what did that do? Of course, made Pete want to go make his own version of the sandwich. He ordered some donuts, 
from Duncan and a slice of cheese separately. Oh, look at that. So there we go. It's on the desk. You're going to have to let me know. It, what, what are you going to, yeah, you let me Fried know. Fried made exclusively for Will Kane. Here mm. we go. Donut and American cheese. Mm. What do you think? Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one, one bite, hey, one bite, everybody knows the rules. Right, right. All right. I barely taste the cheese. I didn't get enough of it. You can taste it a little bit though, right? It works. A lot of sugar taste. A good old dunk. <laughs> Look at Rick's face. Look at Rick's face. <laughs> Act folks outside of our borders are the ones who are going to suffer first and worst from climate change. And we know that climate is a big driver of jobs. The coronavirus has meant we lost hundreds of thousands of jobs, and anyone with eyes can see that those jobs are not going to be replaced by the fossil fuel industry. Uh, what do we do about the fossil fuel industries? tight hold on Washington uh, and state legislature, le legislatures through lobbying. I mean, one thing that is incredibly important is continuing to push on money in politics. That's the way that fossil fuels get involved, through lobbying, through large campaign donations and corruption anti-corruption uh, and money in politics is the key. But I think also in addition to that, we need to really move to support legal actions against fossil fuel companies. States attorneys have already been bringing actions. Uh, and I think continuing to do that and continuing to support those cases is incredibly important. And the last thing is making it very, very, very clear the ways that the fossil fuel industry has misuse science and pumped out misinformation in order to stop uh, action on climate change and they need to be held accountable for that. Rihanna, good to see you again. Uh, let's hope this is the first of many, many conversations about what we're actually doing rather than being aspirational about uh, climate change. Thanks for being at the front of this thing. Rihanna Gunn-Wright is the Director of Climate Policy at the Roosevelt Institute. Well, several rioters suspected of participating in the Capitol insurrection have been arrested and freed from jail. The thousands of Black Lives Matter protesters were arrested over the summer for breaking curfew. There are two systems of justice in this country. I've got another example for you next. And join me tomorrow as I hold a virtual panel discussion on, the, on Alzheimer's for the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. I'll be joined by experts looking to tackle this global health crisis that has a devastating impact on families both financially and emotionally. That's tomorrow morning, Monday, 9.30 a.m. Eastern. I, I gave you the wrong website, or I said the wrong website last time. The website is weforum.org, W E forum.org. More Velshi after this. Sending monthly checks to anyone with kids. Maria Bartiromo is here to react next. With Oscar Mayer Deli Fresh, it's not just a sandwich. Far from it. There's a way in which you yourself have reflected. Um, you know, confirmation hearing uh, is he on track to be confirmed, and if so, is that something we're expecting in this coming week? Yeah, um, he actually received a very friendly reception from the Senate Commerce Committee. Uh, he was praised for his knowledge of the federal transportation policy landscape, as well as his commitment to ensuring the safety of the traveling public. And the leadership of the Commerce Committee really signaled the potential for his confirmation as early as Next week, definitely this month, and this is something uh, that not only the Senate panel, but as well as the nominee uh, concluded that was needed to help advance President Biden's transformative, climate change-centric infrastructure agenda. We've been talking to callers this morning uh, about grading the, the Biden administration, and a concern that several callers have brought up now is uh, the executive order on the Keystone XL pipeline concerned about what that means for jobs. Uh, did that issue specifically come up at the confirmation hearing? Yes, uh, Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, as well as uh, Senator Sullivan of Alaska raised it directly with the nominee and in, in the respect of concern for job loss, potential job loss by reversing uh, the pipeline. Uh, the uh, response from uh, Buttigieg was that there was an acknowledgement of potential impact to the workforce by this uh, executive order, but that this is part of a shift 
from old old technology, uh, old energy, uh, you know, institutions to a modern uh, climate change centric uh, infrastructure agenda, and that this new economy, this new marketplace that will be anchored on clean energy and a new manufacturing industry on this clean energy sector would create uh, new jobs and would help facilitate the transfer of jobs from previous industries to this modern industry. And if they block that, what do you think are the chances that either on that legislation or something else that Senate Democrats will eventually decide, you know what, we're going to kill the filibuster and run the Senate on a one-vote majority? Well, I think the package will pass in, in some form, and I think uh, uh, parts of it should pass, uh, particularly the parts dealing with COVID and, and, and vaccination programs and funding those sorts of things, more testing and so forth. Uh, my problem with the package has to do with some of the things I think uh, will be harmful, actually. I mean, uh, take the $15 federal minimum wage proposal, Chris. You know, restaurants have been one of the hardest hit industries over the past year, and they rely on a lot of low skill workers. And a $15 minimum wage will make uh, it more difficult for them to find workers because the, the, these low, low skill workers will be priced out of out of the labor force. So I don't think something like that is helpful. Or extending uh, unemployment benefits uh, or supplementing unemployment benefits uh, that discourage people from returning returning to work because they're being paid more to stay home. So, so some of this I don't think uh, deserves to pass, but some of it should, and some of it I think will. Um, I, I don't think uh, killing the filibuster would be a very smart idea for Democrats. Uh, they, they would seem to be making the mistake of thinking they'll be in control of the Senate indefinitely. Um, and of course, that is not the case. And you have some senators, Mark Kelly out in Arizona, Raphael Warnock in Georgia, that are going to be up in two years. Uh, and and so I, you know, th this is still a very obviously closely divided Senate, and I don't think they want to they want to jump off that bridge. Donna, uh, your your thoughts about the prospects for the COVID rescue plan? Because while uh, Jason said he thinks some of it will pass, he was talking about a lot that he thinks Senate Republicans won't go go for. What do you think of the prospects for that? And eventually, because you know that the Senate Republicans are going to block some legislation, some of the stuff that that Joe Biden is talking about as a national emergency. At a certain point, do you think Senate Democrats are just going to not be able to restrain themselves and try to kill the filibuster? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I agree with Jason. I think there is so much good in this $1.9 trillion package that the, the country is, is really um, anxious for. Uh, the fact that we are still behind on testing, we're behind on distributing the vaccines. I mean, if you look across the country today, uh, before 8 in the morning, uh, many states roll out their openings and then by 9 o'clock, there's no way you can get a vaccine. So I think this, this package will go a long way in healing some of the pain that we're feeling, the, the people who are still struggling. Uh, and there are many businesses that did not get anything uh, in the last two rounds. So this is, a, I think, a credible package. Joe Biden was elected to, to help lead us out of this pandemic, and I, he's going to continue to fight for that. And I also believe that the Senate do not wish, at least Senate Democrats do not wish to see the same replay uh, as they witnessed back in 2009, where basically one person can block the, all of the good ideas that come forward. So Democrats We'll have to continue to keep that option on the table to eliminate the filibuster. The, the frame was never intended for us uh, to, to have super majorities in right. order to get things done. And I think it's, they need to look at it. And then there is the second impeachment trial, the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Here was the soon-to-be Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer talking about that this week presentation by the parties will commence the week of February the 8th. The January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, incited by Donald J. Trump, was a day none of us will ever forget. Jerry, uh, we heard two very different opinions from Romney and Rubio about whether this trial is just something you have to do or whether it's going to be terribly destructive to the country and, and 
frankly, disruptive to Joe Biden's first days and his agenda in Congress. Where do, where do you come down on that? And is there any chance that 17 Senate Republicans will join with Democrats to convict Donald Trump? You know, what, what I'm really struck by is um, the fact that the president, Joe Biden, has never expressed much enthusiasm for this impeachment trial. They're not opposed to it, but I think they realize the potential for this to be a huge distraction uh, um, and something that slows down the stuff we were talking about just a minute ago, the coronavirus package. And also, by the way, something we haven't mentioned, nominations and confirmations of Biden uh, cabinet picks. You know, those are going to be slowed down by this impeachment trial as well. That doesn't make anybody in the new administration particularly happy. So I think there's a kind of a decided lack of enthusiasm, but it's going to go, it's going to happen, it's going to move forward. One of the side effects here, I think, that's ironic, is it's going to have the effect of giving Donald Trump something he craves, which is more attention and more oxygen. Um, that doesn't please a lot of Republicans either. And what do you think are the chances? Oh, I don't, uh, 17. Yeah, I, I think chances are very slim. I, I just can't imagine 17 Republicans moving. I think you're going to have some, but you're not, I, I would be stunned if you had 17. It's both of you. I'm a boxer and con former Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones, who did the same thing, challenged it over an Ohio uh, uh, elect electors. Um, so I think they were following the rules in 2005, and I think that uh, Cruz and Hawley would say, they were likewise doing now, although it obviously exploded into something else. Well, again, I, I didn't agree with what some of the folks did in 2016. Uh, I do believe there, there was a no attempt to try to overthrow the election results. There was a question in 2016 of looking at um, certain anomaly, anomalies. What, what we had in, what we had in this year, over 60 court cases by the Trump efforts were brought to the courts. I think 59 of those 60 were thrown out. Donald Trump and his you know, enormous ego and unwillingness to accept reality you know, decided to try to overturn those duly constituted results. And he was enabled, uh, obviously, by some of his uh, uh, minions. Um, and the consequences of that was uh, uh, the first active invasion of our capital since the British took it in the War of 1812. I think that's pretty damning. And I think there needs to be accountability. I think we need unity. I absolutely think we need to have unity. Uh, but sometimes, from some of my Republican co colleagues, it sounds like crocodile tears when they start preaching about unity if they're not also willing to say there needs to be some you know, accountability and reconciliation has to come before unity. Coming up, the famous Senate filibuster. Is it here to stay, or will Democrats scrap it? I ask Senator Warner after the break. And in some ways, I think the politics of this country is going to look much like it looked like right after the, the siege on Capitol Hill. There are so many Democrats who want to see President Trump held accountable and to see him barred from office um, because they don't want to see a resurgence of President Trump in particular um, or his brand of politics that was so um, embedded in, in racist tropes in white supremacy, critics would say. Um, but then you see... Republicans like Mike Rounds who say, yes, the, the election was free and fair, but we should still go out and make sure we spend time investigating it. That's going to be, if that's what a someone who believes the election was free and fair says, you can imagine what the people who don't believe the election free and fair w w would say. And one other thing, I think it's really interesting that Joe Biden, in, in calling for bipartisanship, he's having to contend with Republicans who voted to say that he wasn't a legitimately elected president. David Brooks, how do we deal with the Trump era with on the accountability front. I mean, look at the latest stuff out of the Justice Department. I mean, it just gets more cringeworthy by the by the drip, um, especially if he ends up acquitted. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for prosecuting everybody who did everything wrong. I'm, I'm for, all for prosecuting. As for impeachment, I'm hoping it'll just be like a passing wind. Like it'll go on for two days. We'll have an extremely partisan vote and then we can get back to the new America, the Joe Biden America. Uh, I, I would have faith that the Senate could do impeachment and COVID at the same time if Lyndon Baines Johnson were up there or Henry Clay. <laughs> but, but, you know, I see the Three Stooges up there and, and the gang that couldn't shoot straight. So I just don't have faith in the Senate's capacity to do both at once. I hope they do it, get it out of the way in, in a couple of days and move on. Tim Alberta, what's the Republican Party going to look like after impeachment? 
Chuck, it's pretty interesting. I've spoken with a number of Republicans in recent days, including a couple of Republicans who are going to run for president in 2024. And what I've heard uh, has been pretty striking that many of them actually would like to see President Trump convicted. Whether or not they'll follow through on that vote remains to be seen, but they'd like to see President Trump convicted. What they fear is that right now, uh, without a conviction, the president has already begun to fade from public yeah. consciousness. His Twitter feed was taken away. He's not the 800-pound gorilla dominating the news cycle. They fear that a conviction could actually sort of drag him right back center stage, make a martyr of him, and actually allow him, in some strange way, to exercise even more influence, more control over the party moving forward yeah. than if they were just to let him alone and let him sort of fade into obscurity on his own. I tell you, I don't think any of us expect how powerful the deplatforming would be in suddenly getting him to fade away. It's a reminder. He's kind of a little bit lazy in figuring out how to get around it. Um, before we go, we have a word about someone who has been a huge influence on me, on my executive producer, and frankly, all of us at NBC News. It's Tom Brokaw. He is one of those men who truly needs no introduction, particularly here. He is retiring after 57 years at this network. We need another hour to name everything Tom has done here. But as he wrote to me yesterday, the first television news broadcast I saw was the Huntley Brinkley Report, and I was hooked. By 1966, I was briefing David Brinkley on Ronald Reagan's campaign for governor of California. And that was quickly followed by White House correspondent during Nixon and Watergate, host of Today, anchor of Nightly News, and interim anchor of Meet the Press. Tom went on to say, I never tired of it, and the men and women of NBC were and will remain family forever. You know, Andrea, I got the privilege after the tragedy of Tim's death in 2008 to basically be Tom's wingman as he was the interim host here at Beat the Press. And one thing he instilled into me, he said, NBC, other networks may do some other things better than us, but nobody does politics better than us. Don't forget it. Andrea. Well, that's absolutely true. And, you know, he coined the phrase, the greatest generation, the book he wrote in 1998 after his first trip to Normandy in 94. Uh, it just think about it. one day i think about december 9th 2015 the day that candidate trump announced the muslim ban tom was in new york having three hours of chemo he's arming an iv with one hand he writes an essay and he writes an essay and flies to dc about the dangers of paranoia trumping reason about the internment of japanese americans about mccarthy about you know the way black Americans were speaking, and then he speaks about this Muslim American who enlisted after 9-11, yeah. and that he has a permanent home in Arlington. That same night he goes to the German embassy, I was there, yeah. Yeah. and he gets a, the highest possible award from the German government for what he did in 1989 in front of the Berlin Wall, the only American anchor, yeah. to foresee what was going to happen, to be there because of the great reporter he is yeah. and was, the great writer. So well, that's he's the not, legacy. And he's and not going he showed, away. The diplomat. The, that's right. He's Unless, not going away. He's not going away. He's an important touchstone for me on a weekly and biweekly basis for all of us. And you're going to be Thank hearing from him a lot. Thank you, Tom. We love you. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Go Packers. With the Core Trust Bank Mo and the Green Outdoors. Turn on Midwest Outdoors every Sunday. Manager in this renovated 1920s Chevy dealership. Clothes, shoes, books. Right, always formula and diapers. Uh -huh. That's a big item for our family. Right. His wife Giselle runs a charity known simply as the Free Store. The second lady of Pennsylvania was born in Brazil and came to the United States poor and undocumented. Scared of every knock at my door that wasn't, that I wasn't expecting someone because I was worried about being deported. Yeah, you know, when I would leave for school in the morning, my mom would say, I love you, have a great day, be invisible. Invisible no longer, last October she captured this verbal assault while out shopping. 
You're a net. Her struggles and those of other immigrants can nearly bring the imposing John Fetterman to tears. We as a country have to be better than this kind of anti-immigration rhetoric. And we have to be better than that as a country. My life has been immeasurably enriched by my wife and her family and her immigration story. John Fetterman is now exploring a run for the Senate in 2022. In Pennsylvania. And, in and he has a new distinction to add to his resume. GQ magazine described you as an American style guy. No, ta uh, no American taste, taste, taste guy. Taste guy, guy. Yes, taste guy. Yeah. sorry. Yeah. Which I guess is ironic because I have no taste, but I just am what I am. The fact that somebody that, that looks as unfortunate as I do sometimes would be an American taste god by the Bible of American taste, you know, I, I, I didn't see that coming. You know, talk about your 2020 bingo card, yeah. Twenty-five million cases here since then, and more than 400,000 deaths. Sanjay Gupta joins me to talk about the vaccines, the new variants, and the prospect of herd immunity. But first, here's my take. President Joe Biden has many competing priorities as he begins his first term. Dealing with the pandemic, restarting the economy, re-establishing American credibility on the world stage, and competing effectively with China. But it turns out that there's one thing he can do that will address all these problems at once. Vaccinate all Americans as quickly as possible. Biden's current goal of vaccinating a million people a day is far too modest. He should double that, doing whatever it takes to achieve herd immunity for the U.S. by late April or early May. This will instantly boost America's standing and give the president leverage with everyone, from the Republicans to the Europeans to the Chinese. Right now, the rollout of the vaccine is flailing. Donald Trump's Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, predicted that 20 million Americans would be vaccinated by the end of 2020. In fact, that number barely reached 3 million. The situation has improved since then, but there is still chaos and confusion. The Trump administration's mishandling of the vaccine rollout follows a string of other public health failures, including bungled policies on testing, tracing, and isolation, as well as the supply of medical equipment. While the administration did an admirable job funding vaccine development through Operation Warp Speed, it quickly fell back into its familiar hands-off mode once the private sector pulled off that feat. The states whose varying standards and weak infrastructure make them ill-equipped to carry out a mass vaccination campaign have been forced to improvise with predictable consequences. And while the Trump administration has plenty of blame on his hands, this is a much larger failure. As I... She's now fending off attacks from her own party. She already has a primary challenger now. Some Republicans calling for her to be removed from leadership. That vote to impeach George has turned into a fight for her political life. Boy, it sure has. Okay, Rachel, thanks very much. Let's bring our chief Washington correspondent, John Carroll, for more on this. We're seeing the backlash that Liz Cheney is facing in the House. That could complicate this push for conviction by the Senate Democrats. The bottom line, George, right now, Donald Trump is not going to get convicted uh, in the Senate uh, unless there are major new revelations. Mitch McConnell hasn't ruled out uh, voting for conviction, but nobody who I have to to talked to close to McConnell thinks there's any chance that he would actually vote to convict. That said, uh, George, during this trial, unlike the last impeachment trial, you're not going to see uh, significant numbers of Republicans coming out to actually defend Donald Trump. They will focus on the process and the constitutionality. They will argue that it is neither wise nor is it constitutional to convict somebody in an impeachment trial, a president who has already left office. That although Donald Trump may have committed uh, what amounts to high crimes and misdemeanors, impeachment is meant to remove a president from office, pure and simple, is what the Republicans will argue. And Donald Trump, of course, is already gone. President Biden has tried to stay out of this impeachment fight. He wants to advance his agenda at the same time, which means that both sides don't mind this couple of week delay. 
No, and, and, and certainly not Biden. Look, George, if you were to take a look at all of the priorities that Biden has uh, for, for the beginning of his administration, impeachment would rank somewhere below 100. He, the, the, the Biden White House simply uh, does not care about this. Their biggest concern is, is that impeachment could block Biden's agenda in Congress. So, no, absolutely no complaints uh, about the delay uh, from either side, especially no complaints from Biden. And it appears that the Republican Party is coalescing around objections to the size of President Biden's COVID relief plan. Uh, yeah, $1.9 trillion, they've made it clear. Really, every Republican, including uh, Susan Collins, Mitt Romney, the ones you would expect uh, to work with, uh, with the president on this, have made it clear that's too much. Uh, that said, uh, you know, they're, 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 I, I think there is an emerging possibility of a compromise. But of course, George, the big question is uh, whether or not the two sides can come to an agreement about how to actually organize the Senate. There's a big dispute over whether or not to rule out the filibuster. That's what McConnell is insisting on. Uh, and until that's resolved, uh, they won't be able to do any of this. Okay, John Carl, thanks very much. Let's bring in two senators who will serve as jurors for Donald Trump's second impeachment trial. Democrat Amy Klobuchar, Republican Rand Paul. Senator Klobuchar, let me begin with you. And we just heard uh, John Carl say that there is some hope, Senator Klobuchar, that uh, there will be some bipartisan support for the president's bill. Do you believe that, or will Democrats have to go it alone? S Sorry, Senator Klobuchar, are you there? Uh, okay, let's start with Senator Rand Paul. Instead, I think we have some audio problems right there. Uh, Senator Paul, let me begin with a threshold question for you. Uh, this election was not stolen. Do you accept that fact? Well, what I would say is that the debate over whether or not there was fraud should occur. We never had any presentation in court when we actually looked at the evidence. Most of the cases were thrown out uh, for lack of standing, which is a procedural way of not actually hearing the question. There were several states in which the law was changed by the Secretary of State and not the state legislature. To me, those are clearly unconstitutional. And I think there is a, there's still a chance that those actually do finally work their way up to the Supreme Court. Courts traditionally and historically don't like to hear election questions. But yes, were there people who voted twice? Were there dead people who voted? Were there illegal aliens who voted? Yes, and we should get to the bottom of it. I'll give you an example. In my state, when we had a Democrat Secretary of State, she refused, even under federal order, to purge the rolls of illegal voters. We got a Republican Secretary of State, and he purged the rolls. But, uh, Senator Paul, I have to, difference. I, and those things I, I have to, to stop you there. there no, no, no election is perfect, but there, there were 86 challenges filed by President Trump and his allies in court, all were dismissed. Every state certified the results after it's investigations not, not for, not for, count, yeah, but after not investigations counts and recounts. The De Department of Justice, led by William Barr, said there's no widespread evidence of fraud. Can't you just say the words, this yeah. election was well, not what I would suggest is, What I would suggest is that if we want greater confidence in our elections, and 75% of Republicans agree with me, is that we do need to look at inte election integrity, and we do need to see if we can uh, restore confidence in the elections. Well, 75% of Republicans agree with you because they were fed a big lie by President Trump and his supporters who say the election was stolen. Why can't you say... Well, I think where President you make, I think, I think where you make a mistake... In, uh, hey, George, 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 where you make a mistake is that people coming from the liberal side like you, you immediately say everything's a lie instead of saying there are two sides to everything. Historically, what would happen is if I said that I thought there was fraud, you would interview someone else who said there wasn't. But now you insert yourself in the middle and say that the absolute well, fact is that everything I'm saying is a lie. Well, because, Senator, I said, Senator, I said what the president said was a lie because he to. said, hold on a second, to. he said the election was stolen. This election was not stolen. This the results were certified in every you're single saying, state was, you're after saying, counts you're and saying, recounts. You're saying that absolutely it was, you're saying there was no fraud and it's all been investigated. That's just not true. So it's not what I said, sir. I said the Department of Justice yes, found no that, evidence. Let, let me finish, finish my point. You, say it's you all said lies. something that was you, not true. You say we're all liars. You're just simply saying we're all liars. And I said it was a lie that the election was stolen. The premise that you're right, we're wrong. Well, let, no, well let's, let's talk about the specifics of it. In Wisconsin, tens of thousands of absentee votes had only the name on them and no address. Historically, those were thrown out this time. They weren't. They made special accommodations because they said, oh, it's a pandemic, and people forgot what their address was. So they changed the law after the fact. That is wrong. That's unconstitutional. And I plan on spending the next two years going around state to state and fixing these problems. And I won't be cowed by liberals 
in the media who say, there's no evidence here and you're a liar if you talk about election fraud. No, let's have an open debate. It's a free country. It, there's, there is no widespread evidence of election fraud that overturned the results. That was stated as well by the Department of Justice, led by President Trump's Attorney General. In Wisconsin, there were counts and recounts. Well, actually, it was never studied. That, even that's certified. not true. Even that's not true. Even William Barr, Barr said true. that Barr said that. But there was, yes, he said that, yes. That was a pronouncement. There has been no examination, thorough examination of all the states to see what problems we had and see if they could fix them. Now, let me say, to be clear, I voted to certify the state electors because I think it would be wrong for Congress to overturn that. But at the same time, I'm not willing just to sit here and say, oh, everybody on the Republican side is a liar and there is no fraud. No, there were lots of problems and there were secretaries of state who illegally changed the law and that needs to be fixed and I'm going to work hard to fix it and I won't be cowed by people saying, oh, you're a liar. That's the problem with the media today, is they say all Republicans are liars and everything we say is a lie. There are two sides to every story. Interview somebody on the other side, but don't insert yourself into the story to say we're all liars because we there, have some problems. There, there, the there, there, there are not two sides to the story. This has been looked at in every single state. The oh, sure there are. There are two every sides to every state. story. George, you're forgetting who you are. You're forgetting who you are as a journalist. If you think there's only one side, you're inserting yourself into the story to say, I'm a liar because I want to look at election fraud and I want to look at secretaries of state who illegally change the voter laws without the permission of their state legislatures. That is incontrovertible. It happened. And you can't just sweep that under the rug and say, oh, nothing to see here. And everybody's a liar. And you're a fool if you bring this up. You're inserting yourself into the story. A journalist I'm, would hear both sides, and there are two sides of the story. I'm, sta I'm standing by facts. There are not two sides to facts. I did not say there, that this was a perfect election. I said it was. the results were certified. I said it was not stolen. It is You're a saying lie to people say are liars. You're stolen. saying people are liars if they want to investigate what happened in the election. Should That's not what I said. In fact, the tens of thousands of absentee ballots did not have addresses on them and normally were disqualified, but this time they were counted. Should we examine that? I don't know whether it affected the election or not, but I have an open mind, and if we actually examine this and we find out it didn't, that's fine, but it still should be fixed. There, there, there can be more investigations. The investigations that have taken place have shown there is not enough fraud to change the results of this election that has been certified by every state. It was stated by the Justice Department and the Attorney General. And I accepted the state certifications, but it doesn't mean that I think that there wasn't fraud and that there weren't problems that have to be investigated, and it doesn't mean that the law wasn't broken. I believe in Pennsylvania they broke the law, and I believe if that ever would get a real hearing in the Supreme Court, it was denied for standing, it wasn't actually taken up. If it were taken up, I do believe that the Supreme Court would overrule and say that they did break the law illegally. I asked you a very simple question. Was the election stolen or not? I think there was a great deal of evidence of uh, fraud and changing of the election laws illegally, and I think a thorough investigation is warranted. Senator Paul, thanks for your time this morning. Let me bring in Senator Klobuchar now. Let me talk first of all, uh, Senator Klobuchar, about uh, this impeachment proposal now in the Senate. The, the trial is going to start on February 9th. Uh, I was hoping to get to this with Senator Paul. We ran out of time there, but the GOP is signaling they're going to be making a process argument, that it's not constitutional to try a former president, that it won't be legitimate if Chief Justice Roberts does not preside. Your response? It is constitutional. We have precedent from way back when a Secretary of War was tried after he had left office. And obviously there's a remedy that would help in the future, which would ban uh, former President Trump from running again. But as I listened to Rand Paul, George, I just kept thinking, man, this is why Joe Biden won. Uh, the American people right now are struggling. They need pandemic relief. Uh, they are literally trying to balance their toddlers on their knees and their laptops on their desks and teaching their first graders how to use a mute button just to go to school. They need help. And I thoroughly believe that we can handle this impeachment trial and, just as the American people are doing, juggle what we need to get done. Get the Homeland Security Secretary through. We just had an insurrection at the Capitol. Get people confirmed for Joe Biden's cabinet. And yes, give people the help that they need. That's what this next month is going to be about. You just heard John Carl say he doesn't believe there are the votes there to convict. Uh, President Trump right now. And we saw President Trump after the first trial. I'm going to show those pictures right here. When the votes weren't there to convict, he waved uh, the acquitted uh, headline, said this was vindication for him. Are you concerned that could happen again? 
my colleagues have not yet committed about what they're going to do. And the news we just got out of the New York Times yesterday uh, that the president was actually actively trying to take out his own attorney general and put in an unknown bureaucrat uh, conspiring with him, I think we're going to get more and more evidence over the next few weeks as if it's not enough that he sent an angry mob down the mall to invade the Capitol, didn't try to stop it, um, and a police officer was killed. I don't really know what else you need to know. The facts were there. We saw it right there on the platform during the inauguration, as you can still see the spray paint at the bottom of many of the columns. But if the votes aren't there to convict, would you pursue instead either a censure or some kind of a resolution under the 14th Amendment uh, to prevent President Trump from running for office again? We're focused on impeachment, but there are many options. Things can be looked at. But I think the thing that your viewers need to know right now, George, is that we must do many things at once. Uh, there is so much problems out there for the American people. They want those vaccines, and I'm so glad that Joe Biden invoked the Defense Production Act so we can get them produced. We can get the distribution centers set up. Uh, we can make sure that schools can open again. That's what he's focused on. That's what we're focused on. And we can do this impeachment trial at the same time. We could run it in the afternoons, confirm the nominees in the morning, and pass legislation at night. And to the father. Tell the portfolios to through the, the name, the authority, the power of Jesus. Science. That's been a pandemic of its own kind, hasn't it? It has. And we've got to repair it. We have to, because the country's at stake. You got any thoughts for how to begin? There's no vaccination for it. No, there's no vaccination, but I think maybe we have to keep showing by example that being united is much, much better than being divisive. Because divisiveness has really failed. I mean, it has failed us in every single way. Dana Fava Kansa Institute didn't like her in literally every step of her elected office career. She was the first person like her to ever be San Francisco District Attorney, uh, California Attorney General, uh, representing California in the Senate. It was, you know, an entire career of firsts and now as vice president. And so I think she goes in clear eyed uh, regarding the scrutiny that will be on her, not to mention uh, everyone wondering her political future. No one expects this to be her destination. They expect her to want to run for president when, you know, Biden, who takes office, is the oldest president ever to begin uh, his presidency, you know, decides to exit the stage. She's she's presumed to be the standard bearer. So the scrutiny will be intense. Uh, she will say that there's nothing intimidating to her about that scrutiny. It seems to me that Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, represents this concept of a multiculturalism as a good, powerful, worthwhile thing in America. Demographers predict that in the not too distant future, a majority of Americans will be in, in multiracial or in multiracial families. And so in some ways, Kamala Harris actually represents where this country is headed and now we see her carrying that forward into the white house and a confidence in being all of what she is how do you think that's going to play then into her relationship with the new president joe biden they both say that they want to use the obama biden presidency as a guide uh, joe biden was a very you know integral player in that administration and he wants a vice president that is a sounding board that that you know, raises questions. Uh, he wouldn't have chosen Kamala Harris if he didn't want to draw from her perspectives. Obviously, she comes in with deep understanding of the criminal justice system. I would expect her to be a player on immigration. It's an area she really carved out for herself in the Senate. But there's going to be some growing into the role to do. You know, I, I would fully expect Biden does not seem threatened by her in any way, nor should he be. You know, he's reached the pinnacle of his career. He wants to make her, you know, the standard bearer of the Democratic Party going forward. But it may take some time for her to sort of find that role and that voice uh, that she's going to have in the administration. How does she get along with the Republicans in the Senate and, and Republicans in Congress across the board? Right before she ran for president, I um, was writing a profile of her time in the Senate, and I 
went around and tried to find every Republican I could to ask them their impression of her. And universally across the board, they had many complaints on policy or tactics. They didn't They didn't love her questioning of Brett Kavanaugh during the Supreme Court fight, but all of them said she's warm, she's personable, she treats them with respect, uh, she's whip smart, they all said, and anyone who underestimates her will do so at their peril. And it doesn't get as much attention, but she has worked across the aisle. She actually worked with Rand Paul uh, on some criminal justice reform stuff early on in the administration. So the the friendliness is there. The partisanship is also there. Tal Copin, thank you for talking with me. Thanks for having me. Next on Matter of Fact, the skyrocketing price tag for a White House necessity. And what does the future hold for 70,000 migrants seeking asylum at the Mexican border? But first... I went online, changed my voter registration, and became unaffiliated. Chaos, conflict, and a clash of ideals. Could this be the election that splits the major parties for good? Senator, if this is happening to me, what's happening to people who don't have what I have, and don't have the access that I have. Meanwhile, officials have their eye on coronavirus variants and how well the vaccine may hold up as the virus changes. It means we've got to, number one, do much better genomic surveillance so we can identify variants when they arise. It means we've got to double down on public health measures like masking and avoiding indoor gatherings. The bottom line is we're in a race against these variants. The virus is going to change, and it's up to us to adapt and to make sure that we're staying ahead. Natasha Chen, CNN, Atlanta. Joining me now in Los Angeles is CNN medical analyst, Dr. Jorge Rodriguez. Um, Good to see you, doctor. Um, We've seen some dipping of numbers around uh, certainly the U.S. and parts of Europe, which, which, which is good news, very encouraging, but the numbers themselves are still frighteningly high. What is your read on where things stand as vaccines start to roll out? Well, as vaccines start to roll out, I think people need to realize that vaccines are not the end-all and be-all. They are definitely going to help us decrease transmission, but we're not going to see their full effect for two to three months. Uh, And in the interim, we really still need to do what we've always done, which is wear the mask, the social distancing. That triumvirate is not going to change, you know, and washing our hands. So it's a great start. Boy, we have a long way to go. Yeah, I guess, do, do, do you see the number drop? Um, do you think it's just the end of the holiday surge and, and we're going back to what has become, you know, quote unquote, normal numbers, which of course are still devastating? Or do you, or do you see this as hopefully a sustainable trend? Well, I think it is a, a trend. I think it is the end of the holiday surge that we're now seeing a dip. My, my concern is that we get too complacent with even a little bit of success. We're also yearning to get out, right, into the fresh air or or to visit folks, that even a little bit of success should not be taken as an excuse. I was reading something by Justin Trudeau right now that says, stay home, don't make plans for spring break, cancel any vacations, because we're still so high in the number of cases that we really need to see this out through April and May before we can start breathing comfortably. And and, and when we talk about Hopefully, OHL a long time ago. My father would do. Dance has been done right there and then just shoves it. Come on, Carl. Ash. Okay, everyone, our mission. I've got my knife at a 90 degree angle. Politics is being driven by the public health sign. Difference comes in. Kelloland Weather Now gives you instant local weather information when you want it. Kelloland Live Doppler HD. The current conditions. Payroll in less than five minutes with Intuit. Okay, we're going to move back. We're going to move back on down, guys. They had it isolated by that time, but I, I, I got to it as close as I could. Soon, Harriet had Nikki's old. Super Bowl 55 is set. Chiefs Buccaneers in Tampa. Who has the edge? How'd they get there? These are questions we'll answer as SportsCenter continues. Mm -hmm. At 
Jersey Mike's app is short for...